essentials of the church. We've talked about our church doctrinal statement before and what, what we, we believe. We've talked about our mission statement before. Typically, this tends to be a little bit more of a thematic series rather than going straight through a Bible book, but certainly based on Scripture. And as such, um, you know, I want to introduce this series today, and I want to do that, first of all, by asking you this question. I'll show it here. Where did you grow up? Now, how many of you grew up right here in Pine City? Raise your hands. Okay. All of you kids should be raising your hands, all right? You're growing up in Pine City right now. Okay. Um, well, let me ask this. How many of you grew up uh, in Minnesota? Okay, quite a few more. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you at least grew up in the Midwest? Okay. Uh, how many of you grew up on the West Coast? Anybody? Anybody? I'm so sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, how many of you grew up on the East Coast? Yeah. Ooh, ah. Who said sorry? That's it. You're in trouble. Right. The... Um, or, or let, let me ask this. This is a possibility, too. How many of you grew up in the South? All right, Janine, yes. You're all alone, baby. Sorry. Um, how, now, here's one other possibility. Anybody grew up in a different country? Anybody maybe grew up on the mission field or another country? Okay. All right. So a few of you. Yep, yep. Okay. Think about this. No matter where you go, there are unique cultural differences that we have all probably experienced for instance, and they kind of have to do with geographical locations. For instance, I moved here and I found out quickly about two things. Number one, the first thing I found out was called Pine City Time. That is that nothing is ever on time. It's always 10 to 15 minutes late. Um, the other thing I found out was what was called Minnesota Nice. How many of you have heard of that before? Okay. I never know what that was. Um, I've also, how many of you heard of Southern Hospitality before? Okay. I find it interesting just to think about. There's no New Jersey nice, <laughs> and there's no New Jersey hospitality, okay? But that's where I grew up, in New Jersey on the East Coast. Um, but I have seen different things culturally. E even what we call things sometimes are, are, are culturally different. I was at the, the threshing show the other week helping with the kids and to, to pass out ice cream, and they said, we need a cone of chip and mint. And I went, you need what? <laughs> chip and mint. What's chip and mint? I had never heard of it. They were talking about mint chocolate chip. I just never heard that phrase before. Or our kids have come to us and said, Dad, we need pumper pencils. I said, you need what? Mechanical pencils. They call it something different. But there is one battle that is waging, one cultural battle that I've found out about since moving to Minnesota. And it is this. It is whether you play duck, duck, goose or duck, duck, gray duck. Now, a person from Minnesota will argue with you. They, and they will never give in. That no, what is right is duck, duck, gray duck. Did a little research. I found a map that shows the difference between those who play duck, duck, goose and duck, duck, gray duck. You will notice that the only state in the entire country that plays duck, duck, gray duck is... Minnesota. The rest of us play duck, duck, goose. It's, Tim said, it's hard to be, right? I know it is. It's tough. It's cultural, right? We understand that. It's a little different. Now, Webster, the dictionary, defines culture this way, and I'm going to show you this. Here's what culture is. It's, it's the beliefs customs, arts, etc. of a particular society, group, place, or time. It's also defined as a particular society that has its own beliefs, ways of light, art, etc. But I want you to notice this third definition. It is a way of thinking, behaving, or working that exists in a place or an organization. Now think about that definition for a minute. Okay, If you've been around the church much, and I don't mean this church, but the church in a broader sense, you know that it's true and you can't deny the fact that the church has its own unique culture. I mean, we have our own language. But we say things that nobody else in the world understands. We sing songs that have words that even most of us don't understand. I mean, have you ever sung the song, Here I Raise My Ebenezer? We have our own language, we have our own culture, we have our own thoughts, we have our own things, we have our own traditions that don't exist anywhere else. We have our own culture. And if that's true, which 
I think it is, then understand this. The question we need to ask ourselves is this. It is, is the church's way of thinking, behaving, and working, is it based on biblical truth? Is it based on what God says, or is it based on traditions that mankind has just simply made up? You know, what's interesting is a lot of times we will fight much more harshly about the traditions that we've made up than we will about the truth of God's Word. Isn't that interesting? And the question we need to ask ourselves is this, is the culture of the church based on Scripture? And that's really what I want to talk about in this entire series, is, is the culture of the church as based on Scripture. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, verse 47, I, I want to, it kind of gives us insight into what church culture was like in the first century, what it looked like. And a lot of the principles that we'll, we'll cover in this series are found in this passage. So you don't need to turn there, but I'm going to show them to you on the screen. And I'd like to read them together, if you would. So let's just begin reading Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Look at verse number 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Thank you for reading that with me. As we go through this series, we're going to talk about some things that should be involved in the culture of the church. We're going to talk about that the church should be a culture of the cross. It should be a, a culture of forgiveness. It should be a culture of prayer and praise. It should be a culture of giving. It should be a culture of discipleship. It should be a culture of outreach. And it should be a culture of victory. And it's important to understand this one foundational principle. And that is this. That people shape culture. Understand that. People shape culture. And if we're going to establish a healthy church culture... It will take each one of us participating in God's plan for our church. That is the only way we can do that. So today, and most importantly, and really most foundationally, and what leads to all the rest of them is this, is that the church should be a culture of the cross. In a few minutes, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1 as we go through this passage. But understand this, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to real people in a real city, involved in a real church. And this particular church was a church that struggled with living distinctive lives from the culture around them. They struggled with being different than the culture that they were involved in. In fact, one writer, one commentator said this, that there was more of Corinth in the church than there was the church in Corinth. Sounds a little bit like the American church today in some ways. When you think about it, sometimes we, we try to be so culturally relevant that we really lose our identity as what the church ought to be. We try and be so much like the world sometimes to appeal to them, supposedly, that we really lose sight of what Jesus has called us to do. And so when we look through this passage today and when we look through this series, in chapter 1... Paul sets the stage for this entire book of 1 Corinthians. It's a great book for you to read and study. But he sets the theme by emphasizing what is basically the foundation of all Christianity. And that is the cross of Jesus Christ. The absolute foundation of what we believe is the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for the sins of mankind. It is foundational. It is central. Understand this. Paul was so committed to preaching the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Then look at this verse. This is my life verse. This is a verse that, that, that I have just adopted 
hopefully to be what my life is about. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, that I decided to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was committed to preaching the message of the cross. The early church, now think about this, the early church was so committed to preaching the cross and the gospel of the cross and the message of the cross that they were often accused of worshiping a dead man because they were just committed to the message of the cross. And for believers today, here's what I really want us to understand today. Here's the point of of the message today. It's this, that the church is a community that is formed by the cross. That is, we wouldn't exist if it weren't for the cross. I mean, you go into most crosses, they have a, a cross, most churches they have a cross displayed somewhere. The cross of Jesus is why the church exists. We're formed by the cross, but understand this. Our culture ought also to be defined by the cross. And so as we look into 1 Corinthians 1, I want to show you a few things. The first principle is this, and that is that the cross unites and divides people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul talks about the fact that the cross unites and divides people. When he uses the phrase, the word of the cross, some translations call it the message of the cross. What he's talking about is the gospel in all of its fullness. He's talking about the entire message of God becoming a man, of God becoming a man in Jesus and living a sinless life for us and making the perfect sacrifice for sinful humanity so that we could then in turn know God. That's what he's talking about. Oswald Chambers said this, He said, all heaven is interested in the cross of Christ, all hell terribly afraid of it. Now listen to this. While mankind are the only beings who more or less ignore its meaning. The cross is really what stands between a believer in hell and what stands between an unbeliever, a lost person in heaven. The cross is the center. See, understand this, the cross divides those who do not believe. That's what the scripture says here in verse 18. And people without Christ just think the message of the cross is absolutely ridiculous. The Jews of Paul's day, they stumbled at the meaning of the cross because there's no way they could figure out in their thinking, how in the world could the Messiah be crucified? There's no way. They were looking for someone to come and to conquer and to set them free, and the Messiah could not have been on a cross. We can't even think about that. So they stumbled over it. The Greeks of Paul Day, they actually, they laughed at it because they thought, how in the world could a man hanging on a cross be the way of salvation for the whole world? That, that doesn't even make sense to them. And here's the thing, not much has changed in 2,000 years. People still don't understand the cross. And it's heartbreaking, and here's why. Because folks, listen to me. The human race is perishing without the grace of Christ. Humanity is lost. Listen to me. Right now, today, at this moment, there are people that are going to be eternally lost if they don't come to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. There are people in this world There are people in this nation, people in this city, in our neighborhoods, 
sometimes in our own homes and families that are absolutely perishing and will face an eternity without Christ if they do not come to know Him. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus said this, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Uh, Billy Graham once said this. He said, Calvary is the place of decision. It is the eternal sword erected to divide people into two classes, the saved and the lost. See, sometimes in churches we've swallowed philosophies that are not biblical. We kind of think everybody's good, everybody's okay, and and, and, and as long as people are kind of nice people, everything will work out. But the truth of the Scripture is this. Jesus said it, that if people do not believe in the name of the Son of God, if they do not put their faith in the one who died on that cross, they will be eternally lost. I mean, that's the truth of the Scripture. Folks, that's the truth of the Gospel. And understand that. If that's not the foundation of what, belie- what we believe, that sin separates us from God, then what in the world are we here for? We've got to understand that the cross divides. But you have to understand this too. The cross also unites those who do believe. To us who are saved, the message of the cross is the power of God. Save people, we look at the cross differently. I mean, it is the cross where we see the light. It is the cross where we see the sacrifice that God made for us. It is the cross that we see the love of God for humanity. That's why Paul would say in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What he's saying is, I'm not ashamed of the cross because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. So we understand that the cross... We see the love of God in it. But understand this, that the cross also calls us into fellowship one with another. Jesus died for us. We are His followers. We identify with the cross. That's the basis of our unity. That's the basis of what brings us together. And when we view it properly, we understand that if we view the cross properly, then truthfully, divisions in the church are erased. Because we understand that the cross is the center of all that we believe. And all those things that divide us are pushed away because all of our attention is focused and exalted on the one who died on that cross for us. Now, practically, I asked myself this question. How in the world can the cross unite such different people? I mean, in any church, you have different people from different backgrounds. But specifically in a free church, you often have people from all different kinds of backgrounds. It's, it's, it's just kind of a melting pot. To me, that fascinates me. It excites me. I think it's wonderful. Um, but how can the cross unite such different people? It takes two things. I'm going to give it to you, and then I'll explain. The first thing, it's because of the wisdom of God. And it's also because of the power of God. You see, the cross shows us the wisdom of God. It shows us that all people are sinners, that all people are in need of a Savior, and that includes you and that includes me. We are all in need of a Savior. And it teaches us that if God loves us, then we ought to love one another. We can see that in the cross. The cross shows the wisdom of God. But it also shows us the power of God. It demonstrates the power of God to save. And, and you know what? We need that power working in us. Because if you don't know it, it is really not natural for any of us to be others-focused. It's natural for us to be self-focused, right? To be myopic. To be focused on ourselves and want what we want and, and love what we love and kind of push everyone else away. Because, you know, after all, doesn't our culture teach us? you got to look out for number one. Yet God calls us to be others focused the cross was God being focused on humanity satisfying his wrath so that we could know him and it takes the power of God to live the way God wants us to live so understand this the cross unites people and divides people it's foundational the second principle is this from this passage the cross humbles people 
Look at verse number 26. I'll read it to you. Paul says, <clears throat> For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Here's why. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This Corinthian church, as you read through the first and second Corinthians, you find out they had this tendency to be puffed up. They had this tendency to really let pride take hold of their lives. And, and by the way, we have the same tendency today. Most of us have. The, the root of all sin is pride. We all struggle with it in one way or another. However, here's the thing. The cross really leaves no room for pride. God is not impressed with our looks. God is not impressed with our social position, our achievements, our heritage, our financial status. God's not impressed with any of those things. The cross is the great equalizer. The old hymn says it best. The old hymn says that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You see, we all are sinful and need the grace of Christ. And understand this, but because of the cross, God calls the undeserving. In verse 26, uh, there's this phrase, calling. He says in verse 26, consider your calling. Now, sometimes when we read that word in Scripture, it speaks of what God has called you to in ministry and in life, but that's not the context here. The context here is that we're really talking about salvation. We're talking about the call of God that brings us to salvation. And Paul is saying to these believers, he's really reminding them, hey, don't forget what you were like before you knew Christ, before you came out of the darkness and into the light. That's one of the reasons why I like to, in, in my own mind and with others, share my story of how I came to know Christ. Because it keeps me reminded of the fact that, you know what? I didn't deserve a bit of it. And I was not a good guy. And it was only because of the grace of Christ that I can stand before anyone today and that I can even claim to know Christ. And so what it's talking about here is, is the idea that we've been called to salvation and we're undeserving of it. Paul's saying God doesn't call the wealthy. He doesn't call the wise or the social prominent or, or, or the powerful or the good. And if you were any of those things before you got saved, you weren't saved because of them. You were saved in spite of them. Mark, Jesus says like this in Mark chapter 2. He says, those who are a whole have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Robert Murray McShane was a Scottish preacher of many years ago, and, and he was passing out a gospel uh, pamphlet one time, and he passed it to this woman, and she was incredibly offended by the fact that he would hand her this message of the fact that she needed Jesus as her Savior. And she looked at the pastor, and she said, Look, you must not know who I am. And McShane said, Ma'am, there's coming a day of judgment and on that day, it will not matter who you are. And that's true. God calls the undeserving. We don't deserve it. It is grace that brings us to Christ. But because of the cross, God also chooses the unlikely. Verse 27 and 28 talk about that. That it's through the power of, cro of the cross that God kind of blocks the pathway of pride and that He opens the hearts of people that no one would expect. In the world's way of thinking, strength is strength. If you're physically strong, you're strong. Weakness is weakness. Um, intelligence is intelligence. But God has a way of turning the world's way of thinking totally up on its ears. Totally upside down. God calls those who may be weak in the world's eyes to be strong in His eyes. God takes some of the weakest things in the world and makes them strong. Takes some of the things that the world thinks is so wise and He confounds them and He, realizes, he makes people realize they're foolish. And because of the cross... It's not only possible for us to be saved, but it's also possible for God to use us to share the gospel with people. God calls us to be His representatives on this earth. And, and really, that's an incredible thing. And, and 
you know, as I was thinking about this, sharing the message of Christ's Son with others and the fact that God calls unlikely people to do it, I read all kinds of stories this week. And sometimes I struggle with sharing personal stories because I don't want it to be focused on me, but I just want to be really open with you. It's very interesting when God calls people. When I was younger, and I still have this same issue, I have always, all of my life, struggled with a reading comprehension pro, uh, problem. I can, I remember as a kid, I used to get so mad. I would cry, I'd be so angry. Because I have this piece of paper, and I'm supposed to answer these questions from this, you know, two-page story, you know, with, you know, see Jane run, see spot. I mean, and I'd, I'd read it, I'd go to the question, I'm like, did I read about Jane? Huh? And i go... I, would, I mean, I literally would get so angry with it because I, I just I couldn't get it. And I still struggle with this today. Um, I, I, you know, Jace just took a test recently, and he, he took a test on some book he had read, and he was excited. He got 10 out of 10 right. And I was just like, that's really nice, man. <laughs> I said, I might have gotten 2 out of 10 even today. I've always struggled with it. And so here's the wisdom of God. So God takes a guy who struggles with reading comprehension terribly, and you know what one of, the num- one of the main things that a pastor does is? Reads and relays what he reads, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? We think, now please listen. We think, because we're programmed by the world to think this way, that my weaknesses keep me from doing things for Christ. I, people tell I can't do this because whatever the reason may be. And we sit back and we rest on that. When the cross and the power of God working through Jesus says, you know what? I can take your weaknesses and I can make them strengths. Paul said this way, when I am weak, he is strong. So think about it. The Bible, excuse me, not the Bible, but history tells us about a man named D.L. Moody, who maybe you've heard of. D.L. Moody was a man who Janine would never, ever want to read anything from D.L. Moody because he slaughtered the English language. He, he was an uneducated man. He was, he was, he was kind of a, a, I mean, from accounts I've read of him, you'd almost think he was almost a little thuggish. He was just a big, tough, kind of a brute. And, but he, he fell in love with Jesus and he started preaching the gospel. And one time he actually came to Cambridge University to, to preach the gospel in chapel. Now, Cambridge University at that time was the center of learning, not only in England, but the world. I mean, this was the intellectual center of, of Great Britain. And D.L. Moody was coming. And the students heard about it. And they began to make plans to make fun of him. They were going to hoot him when he, when he used English wrong. You know, in their mind, he slaughtered the king's English. And so he comes up to the stage, and the first thing he says to these students, he says, young gentlemen... Don't ever think God don't love you, for He do. <laughs> now, if you don't know, that's not proper grammar. <laughs> but you could have heard a pin drop in the chapel. For whatever reason, I know what the reason was, it's the power of God working through the gospel. But those students sat silent. And he began to preach, and several times he said it again. Young men, don't ever think God don't love you, because He do. And that day, many of those young men that had in their minds decided to mock D.L. Moody came to know Christ as their personal Savior. Some even went into full-time ministry preaching the gospel to others. God takes the foolish things of the world. He calls the unlikely. He calls the undeserving. He chooses the unlikely to serve Him. And you may be here today and you think, you know what, I have this weakness and I can't serve Jesus. Yes, you can. Because folks, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about the power of God shown in the gospel of Christ working through us to reach others. We're way too self-focused. We serve a big God. And He can do incredible things in spite of our weaknesses and through our weaknesses. So understand, the cross humbles us. It humbles people. Grace is because of Him. And anything we can do for Christ is because of Him. So understand, the cross humbles people the cross divides and unites people. And here's the last principle. And that is that the cross transforms people. Look at verse number 30. 
Paul writes, speaking of Jesus and the message of the cross, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Again, this whole passage started in verse 18, that the cross is the power of God. That word power is the word we get dynamite from. It's, it's the word dunamis. It's the idea of, of incredible power and force. The power of the cross, Paul is saying, is, is a greater force than that of dynamite. And how do we know that? How do we know that the message of the cross is so powerful? Because it changes lives. Because it transforms lives. I, I want to I give you a, a website. If you like to go to websites, there's a website called imsecond.com. And on that website, you have incredible stories of famous people who in their quote-unquote strength have come to know Christ and understand that they're not first. He's first and they are second. They understand that the cross is the power of God and the cross changes their lives. A.W. Tozer said this, he said, the cross is rough and deadly, but it is effective. The message of the cross changes life. And because of this cross, here's what Christ is. First of all, He's our righteousness. And that that simply means this, that He saved us from sin's penalty. He saved us from the penalty of sin. Righteousness has to do with our standing before God. Um, When we trust in Christ, there's this exchange made. We exchange our sinfulness with Christ's righteousness. When He died for us on the cross, He took our sins. And when we accept Him... His righteousness is given to us. 2 Corinthians says it this way. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin. Why? That in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So, He saves us from sin's penalty. Isn't it incredible to know that because of the cross, we can rejoice and we can know that we've been delivered from the wrath to come. I mean, I stand here today... And I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, I don't have to worry about what's going to happen when this life is passed. Whether Jesus comes back or I die physically, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to go and what's going to happen. Why? Because you're a good guy? No, not because I'm a good guy, but because Jesus has saved me from the penalty of sin through his cross. He died in my place. He took my sin. He saves us from sin's penalty. Secondly, He becomes our sanctification, the verse says. And that is, He is saving us right now from sin's power. By the way, I would underline those three words if you underline the Bible. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, righteousness has to do with our standing before God. We've been declared righteous, justified, if you would. Sanctification is the process where the Holy Spirit works in our lives in such a way that God begins to make us Christ-like. He begins to work into us the, 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 the character traits of Jesus Christ. He changes us from the inside out. J.I. Packer wrote this, Regeneration is new birth. Sanctification is growth in grace. And in sanctification, the Holy Spirit works in you to will and to do according to God's good pleasure. So that's not natural for us. It's not natural for us to want to do God's will and to want to follow God. It's natural for us to want to do what we want to do. You don't even have to teach kids to be self-centered, do you? You know what kids, one of their first words is always, mine! How are your parents and you resonate with that? (laughs) Mine! I mean, kids, if it's mine, it's mine. If it's yours, it's mine. If I see it, it's mine. If I want it, it's mine. It's mine. Yeah, Jason, it's mine. You know, it's like a little bird. It's on Nemo. Mine, mine, mine. Why? That's, I mean... Sin works in us. It's not natural for us to want to follow God's will. But the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Here's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. And we all, speaking of those of us who follow Christ, with unfailed face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is that Spirit. So God changes us from grace to grace from glory to glory, giving us the, the, the character traits of Jesus. And here's the thing. 
I wanted to get this across. We will never be sinless in this life. But as we grow in grace, we should sin less. And, and he does that by working in us. And right now, today, he's saving us from sin's power through sanctification. And the last thing he work, mentions here is redemption. He says Christ is our redemption. That simply means he will, he will one day save us from sin's presence. Redemption is the idea that we're set free. The word redeemed means to be set free, to be, to be ransomed, to be purchased from the slave market and set free. And the truth is, in some respects, we understand that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He paid our ransom price. But ultimately, true final redemption doesn't happen until Christ returns. Paul says it this way, that Jesus will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And John writes it this way, that beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And so, won't it be incredible when one day we finally stand before Jesus completely redeemed? When the world has passed away and we stand before Christ in full salvation, entering into the joy of Christ, it'll be incredible. See, here's the thing. The message of the cross changes people's lives. We could go through this room today, and probably most of you could quickly and easily tell us about how God changed your life through the message of the Son. And we could go through the whole world and we could see the same thing, God changing the coldest hearts through the power of the message of the cross. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, it costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things, but to convert rebellious wills cost him crucifixion. It cost him his son dying in our place. I want to show you this verse and then ask you a question and we'll be done. Galatians chapter 6, Paul writes, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. When Paul is saying, uh, talking about boasting in the cross, what he's saying is this, is that the cross was his singular passion, is that there was nothing that made more of a difference that made more of an impact, that meant anything more to him than the cross of Jesus Christ. Nothing else compared to it. And the question for each of us this morning is this. Do we boast in the cross? What is our passion? What else in our life compares to the cross of Christ? Hopefully we understand theologically, biblically, nothing else compares, but practically what else in our lives do we allow to have greater importance than the cross of Christ? Do we boast in the cross? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Today, I wonder... I do this occasionally. How many of you would say, you know what, Pastor? I have received the message of the gospel. I have received the message of the cross that Jesus died in my place, was my substitute. I've accepted Christ as my Savior. And I'm not ashamed to let you know that today I stand as a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. I know Him personally. I know even if I died today, I'd go to heaven because I know Christ would you slip your hand up in the air and just let me know. God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. Now, I, I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you couldn't raise your hand and you'd just be honest with me and say, you know, uh, Pastor, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I'm not sure where I stand with God. I'm not sure if I believe in God. I'm not sure if I stand with I, I just, I, I don't know. I'm just being honest. I'm not sure. You know, I would like to pray for you. I would like to pray that God would work in your life in such a way that you could be sure. 
Now, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you or make you stand up or anything like that. But I would love to pray for you. And so is there one today who would just say, or two or three, who would just say, you know what? I don't know where I stand with God. But would you pray for me? That's all you're asking. That's all I'm going to do. But Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know where I stand with God. Is there any like that today who would just slip their hand up quickly and say, I don't know where I stand with God. Just don't know. Any today? I don't know where I stand with God. For us who are followers of Christ, let's make much of the cross. It's the reason Jesus came, was to die in our place, to be our substitute, to satisfy the wrath of God as our atonement. Let's make our church a culture of the cross. May the cross stands at the center of all that we do, all that we think, all the ways we act, and all the work we do. Our Father, thank you so much for your goodness, for the power of the word, and how it does, Lord, the message of the cross is the power of God, and how it changes lives. And Lord, I, I have had the privilege of sitting with so many of these dear people and hearing how the message of the cross has changed their life. Now the message of the cross can take a sinful person and change them into a person with new desires, a new outlook on life, a new worldview, and a desire to follow Christ. So Lord, thank you for each one today that stands unashamed and says, I'm not ashamed of the cross. I want to follow Jesus. Lord, if there's someone here today that does not know Christ, even though they may not have raised their hand, God, I pray that you would convict them. The Holy Spirit, you would speak to their hearts and convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment, that they might come to understand the gospel of Christ. They might come to know him. Lord, thank you for the privilege it is to meet together as a faith family. And Father, we just praise you today, and we thank you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do something... This morning, we have a child dedication we're going to do. Now, uh, if I could have the Engs come. The uh, John and Karen Eng are bringing uh, Aiden and I believe some other members of their family. And uh, this is an opportunity for us as a church to come together with this family and, and just uh, support them in this day. And on Friday, Friday, right? On Friday, they officially adopted Aiden into their family. And so we're thankful for that, and they want to dedicate him and themselves to Christ today. And so let me just read a, a quick scripture. The Bible says in Psalm 127, that behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the room is his reward. And um, God thinks children are important, and I'm, I'm glad for that. And the Bible says that they're a gift from the Lord, that God gifts us with these children. That he, I mean, think about that. Our children are gifts from God. They don't always feel that way, but that's the truth. They're gifts from God. And so here's what God calls us to do. God gives us this responsibility to train children. He asks us to train up our children in the ways of God, to be an example of Christian living inside the home and outside the home, to provide for, to protect, to nurture our children, to, to make them a part of our family, to share with them our love, our time, our lives, to teach them to love the same Jesus that you love and to teach them to honor him and obey him and serve him with their lives but you know what's wonderful that's an incredible responsibility i remember when my first son was born it was like wow whew, this is big this is like real now i gotta take care of this kid and it's an awesome responsibility but please understand this that you have two wonderful helpers in this life the first is christ